Hello guys, how's it going? My name is Dalram, and in today's video, I'll be doing a, an extensive Outlaw Rogue PvP guide in order to help you guys figure out how to play Outlaw Rogue for yourselves and improve when it comes to 7.3. Now, there wasn't a lot of changes for 7.3, so I am going to have a link for 7.25 guide for Outlaw in the description down below, so you guys can go check it out as it was pretty fairly detailed and I think it will be shorter than this video, so if you want a shorter TLDR version, you can go check out that one. But if you want this one and you are somebody new at Rogue, then this video will cover all the basics to help you get started playing Outlaw in PvP. It's a challenge spec, but it's a lot of fun once you get a hang of it. And it's one of those specs where you have to try a little bit harder just to be average at, which I find the challenge a lot of fun. Anyway guys, thanks so much for... So I hope you guys enjoy the guide, I hope you find it useful, and let's get on to the video. Now let's talk a little bit about Outlaw Rogues within PvP. The item level and stats and how that works together for PvP. A lot of times I get a question of what stats should I stack? And for PvP, it's the answer is simple. You don't stack any stats. You get predetermined stats based on your item level. But if you do want to improve on your Outlaw Rogue and you can't always get gear the fastest way, grinding up AP and making sure your weapon is fully capped out to concordance and start stacking that concordance is probably the best way to start getting yourself a little bit extra damage increases where you can do it with gear. So with that out of the way, let's talk a bit about talents and some of the options we have as an Outlaw Rogue. In the first row, I feel like all three talents are actually fairly viable. All three of them are useful, but currently in the meta, I'm preferring Swordmaster because I feel that when I do get a lot more procs for Saber Slash, whether you're doing burst or whether you're doing sustain damage, it just adds a little bit of from damage. It is an RNG proc chance and it's only 10% increase for Saber Slash proc, but it's kind of nice when I don't have Jolly Roger and I am getting procs for Saber Slash here and there. But all three options are viable, so choose whichever one is more comfortable for you, where Ghost of Strike is more keen to apply you a little bit extra oomph and burst. Quick Draw, on the other hand, would be more useful if you want to maximize the use of your common points generated. And if you have an issue with common points, then that one might help alleviate some of your issues. Again, a proc chance, but whenever the proc does happen, it allows you a little bit more surge for common points, so it allows you a little bit more play. In the second row, Grappling Hook is the only viable option. It is the only one that offers you a lot of mobility, the 40 yard range, the 30 second cooldown, the CDR mechanic for it as well is very handy. It's great in arenas and works in BGs. It did get broken a little bit. Not sure what Blizzard did, but in 7.3, the Grappling Hook is a little bit harder to land now when it comes to, let's say, getting out of the pit in Cod Mogu, or in specific arenas where you want to get on the second level. You have to be at an angle, you have to be at a right distance, you maybe have to jump up and use the ability, but for the most part, it still works the same way it did, and still offers you the most amount of mobility. On our third row, Deeper Strat is the only viable option as it is the only one that offers you a damage increase because most of our damage comes from our finishers. It also synergizes really well with your artifact weapon so it makes it the flat best choice in that row. In the fourth row, Elusiveness is the best option. If you're able to play around with faint and pre-faint certain mechanics, you could pre-faint stunts that would otherwise render you dead, you could pre-faint bursts that would otherwise wreck you, and overall, because Rogue is so squishy, faint offers you a little bit of that tankiness as long as you're able to manage it with energy and the cooldown and the duration. In the fifth row, Dirty Tricks is the only best option. I wish Prey in the Week was a viable option. I wish they would do something with Parlay. But Dirty Tricks allows you energy less gouges, blinds, and most of your other CC in the game. In the sixth row, Alacrity is the only best option. I wish Killing Spree did damage, but the tooltip is a little bit misleading. It says it deals a lot of damage, but when it comes to doing damage in Arena, while a Mage might take a lot of damage, a Paladin will take less because they wear plate. So, if you're going against Clothies, I guess Killing Spree is alright, but if you're going against anything with Leather and above, you're simply just allowing yourself to deal less damage. Cannibal Barrage, I wish it was a viable option, it deals no damage for AoE, it deals no damage for single target, so Alacrity ends up buffing our opportunity to do a lot more run-throughs where most of our damage comes from. So, being able to stack it up in an Arena or a BG with that haste, but the fact that you gain more haste per stack compared to previous patches, Alacrity ends up being the best option in the row. Finally, it's an option between Slice and Nice and Mark for Death. I feel like Mark for Death and Roll the Bones mechanic is still very important when it comes to getting better at Outlaw. Technically, you can run Slice and Dice as the difference is very 
little, you are going to lose a variety of different buffs that you'll be able to play, and you are losing Mark for Death, which I value for PvP. I would suggest you run Mark for Death and get used to the Roll the Bones mechanic, but if you're somebody who is brand new or wants to play this very casually, I guess you could just stick with Slice Nice, but with Slice Nice, you are choosing to give up some aspects that make Outlook what it is in PvP. Let's take a look at the PvP talents. Now these are going to change depending on what you're doing and who you're facing. This is the talent tree and build that I run for most battlegrounds and I adjust it slightly, like literally very slightly, depending on who I'm going against in arenas. I go for Gladiator's Medallion unless you're a human or an orc where Adaptation and Relentless might even be an option. In the second row, I'll go Reinforced Armor, unless I'm going against melee, like pure melee, where sparring ends up being the better option. In the third row, generally, I go Maneuverability, because Sprint is on the global cooldown reduction mechanic thing for Outlaw, so I can use my Sprint a lot more often and get more value out of it. But if I'm going against like a Paladin or classes that have to use abilities to get a gap closer, and those abilities have a fair cooldown, then Shiv might be a better option. In the fourth row, I usually go Thick as Thieves, because Chick's a trade mechanic to be able to buff a friendly target as well as your own burst is pretty invaluable in arenas and battlegrounds. In the fifth row, I go Control as King, as it is the only option that allows you for more damage, and it procs fairly often, because it can proc off of your own stuns and stuns of anybody around you, polymorphs and silences, which there are a lot of in the game. In the last row, I usually go Plunder Armor, as it takes off 20% of enemy's health and busts my damage, which is great for bursts and one-shotting people, but I go Dismantle from time to time when I'm going against pure melee teams and cleaves and arenas, just so my healer doesn't die. Now let's talk a bit about the basic rotation of the Outrogue. You first of all buff up yourself with a Roll the Bones mechanic, then you build up common points with saber slashes and pistol shots, and then you burst using run through and between the eyes to stun targets. You do a lot of CC between gouges, kicks, blinds, saps, and whatever other plethora of abilities, as well as you buff your friendly targets in a team situation, whether it be battlegrounds or arenas, in order to get them a little bit extra damage of an oomph, uh, also to get yourself a damage oomph, but you mostly play a support role with CC and burst when it comes to damage, while your sustain damage doesn't really quite exist, which is a pretty simple mechanic to play with when it comes to a plain outlaw, it just takes a little bit of time to get used to this whole playstyle. Now let's talk a little bit about the buff mechanic for outlaw, and the buff mechanic works as such, you build up common points and you use roll the bones to generate random buffs. Now these random buffs are completely RNG, and there's six different buffs, and there are a couple different combinations, you can get a one buff, two buff out of the six buffs or a five buff combo out of six buffs and learning these buffs is going to be integral in terms of learning how to play your outlaw in most cases you should be able to see the picture of the buff understand what that buff does and then kind of continue on playing the game instead of having to picture mouse over read what the buff does figure out oh okay maybe i should do this and this and this and then play so it's all about really be, being able quick on a draw and learning when to roll when to re-roll and when to keep whatever buff you get now there's six different buffs, there's stuff like broadsides which makes your abilities to generate common points generate an extra common point and deal 20% more damage, buried treasure which is a 30% energy regen, grand melee which is a 55% auto attack damage speed increase uh, and 25% leech, uh, we have your shark fist of waters which is a crit buff for 25%, true bearing which adds an extra second to your cooldown reduction mechanic for every common point that you invest into a finisher. And the last buff is Jolly Roger, which gives you a 25% chance increase for your Saber Slash to get a second free Saber Slash, which causes a free pistol shot proc. That's a lot of buffs to learn. The easiest way is to do, just make, make a mental image of every single icon and understand buff by the icons themselves. After practice, it takes a little bit of while. Now, honestly, out of all those buffs, none of them are a bad single buff. So if you get any of these as a single buff, that's a damage increase. The only one that's bad is Grand Melee, as it doesn't really offer you a lot for PvP, unless you're taking a lot of damage and you might be able to benefit from the 25% leech by popping a heal on yourself, popping faint, and trying to deal damage to an enemy, slowly generating your own health back. That is just very unique though. It happens seldom, I, I can count that on just one hand, I think three times that it saved me in Arena, but that's really about it. If you get any combination of two of those buffs, even if one of them is Grand Melee, any two buff 
is a good damage increase and allows you to play your spec to be more sustain based depending on what, what buff you get be a little bit more versatile and is usually the comfortable spot where a lot of people are and or where they want to be when it comes to buffs i think it's best to learn how to use every single buff separately and adjust your playstyle slightly based on each singular buff but if you get a two buff then you'll feel a lot more powerful and a lot of people will feel comfortable in that area then there's also the legendary 5 buff, which used to be a 6 buff, but was too strong. The 5 buff basically means you, makes you a god mode. So you don't even have to pop cooldowns, but if you do, you're hitting even harder. Uh, you're basically the most versatile thing in the world. So if you have a chance to get a 5 buff, which is a 1 in 100% chance, so it's a 1% chance, uh, then you are basically godly. Have fun, do whatever you want to do when it comes to the 5 buff mechanic, and uh, just wreck faces. Now, there's a rule to the uh, buff mechanic. You have a 1 in 5 chance to get 2 or more buffs. That means you have 1 in 5 chance to get 2 or 5 buff roll. And that's a pretty good statistic. Now, there will be some moments where you'll be rolling and rolling and rolling for 10, 20 times and you'll get a sick so 1 buff back to back to back. But it, you're also as likely to get something like a 5 buff back to back to back. I've got a 5 buff 3 times in a row. And when that happens, like honestly, there's nothing the enemy team can do in arena. I don't even have to pop cooldowns or even defensives. I'm just in god mode, stunning the world, cooldown reduction, dealing more damage, critting everywhere. Uh, even I have leech at one point or another, combo points out of the wazoo. It's really impossible to stop you. So you have to uh, take the good with the bad. You have to take the punches with the buffs. So you really just have to balance that out and really just figure it out for yourself. When it comes to this mechanic now the burst rotation for an outlaw rogue is really simple you pop your artifact weapon which makes it so that any ability that generates a common point just fills your common point bar to the brim so with a single saber slash you'll get six common points as long as you're running deeper strat which is why deeper strat is good with our artifact weapon so your rotation becomes saber slash run through it saber slash run through it saber slash run through it if you want to conserve your energy and you get a free pistol shot proc you are free to use pistol shot procs but if you're able to sink as many saber slashes as possible, if your energy allows, you'll do a lot more damage. But if you have to conserve energy with pistol shot, it's completely viable. Your stun is between the eyes. It is a ranged stun that has one less second than everybody else in terms of row classes, in terms of how long it stuns. But with deeper strategy, you still get that 6 second stun. This stun is very interesting. It's off the cooldown reduction. So you can use call points into finishers to get your stun back faster. And your own stun works to get your stun back faster. As soon as you stun the enemy, you're not going to have to deal with that 20 second uh, cooldown reduction mechanic. If you don't have true bearing, you'll probably start at about 17 seconds or so, which is interesting. Your stun deals a decent amount of damage. And if it crits, it crits for very, very, very hard. So if you get Shark Pested Waters buff, you may try to go for a stun for a roll. Maybe you'll get a good crit and put your enemy in behind. And especially when you're bursting, you may substitute some of your run throughs for between the eyes. So you can basically have a full kidney on the enemy, then saber slash run through, saber slash run through, saber slash another full kidney if you're really good at cooldown reduction and have the right buffs. And saber slash run through, saber slash run through, saber slash, maybe another cooldown reduction with you between the eyes. So you can really have some fun combos with that. Let's talk a little bit about the cooldown reduction mechanic, which is covered through the passive of Restless Blades. First of all, you should look through all your spells, all your abilities, all your passives, read them thoroughly so you understand exactly what you're doing. But the way Restless Blades works is, for every common point that you spend into a finisher, be it you're between the eyes, you roll the bones, or your run through, every finisher in the game, for every common point you spend into a finisher, so maximum up to 6 with deeper strat, you shave off half a second, 0.5 seconds, off of, of your major offensive abilities and a plethora of other CC or utilities. That can be included through sprint, it can be included into you between the eyes, your adrenaline rush, your grappling hook, and there's a plethora of other abilities as well, like vanish. That's actually the only other one that I'm missing on the list. That's the one you need. But that mechanic is an interesting mechanic because it allows you shorter cooldowns for a lot of your abilities, especially if you're able to manage common points, manage energy, and really cycle through your common points, especially when you have your artifact weapon available, which takes skill, takes practice, and take, uh, takes a little bit of energy pulling. Now, with one of the buffs, True Bearing, it adds an extra second to that cooldown reduction mechanic. It used to be that True Bearing was the way to do the whole cooldown reduction mechanic for the game, but they changed it up a little bit so that you're more consistent when it comes to cooldown reduction. 
which is a good thing because you basically have cooldown reduction available at all times. So true bearing, they had to nerf it a little. But with true bearing, you get one and a half second off of all of your abilities, which you would think it would be slower than tomb from previous patches, but it doesn't feel all that different. So if you're able to get cooldown reduction mechanic through true bearing and take advantage of it, you should really watch out for whatever your cooldowns of your abilities because while the number might say 20 seconds, it'll probably not be 20 seconds. It'll probably end up being like 12 or something. If depends on how good you are at Rogue. Let's talk a little bit about CC. We have a basic one called Gouge and this is actually a unique CC. Gouge is an incapacitation. So it DRs with stuff like saps or anything that DRs with saps. It generates your combo point and can be free of energy if you challenge yourself properly with dirty tricks. This ability is very interesting and very unique because it actually stops a lot of mechanics. It'll stop casts for healers. So let's say your kick is on cooldown or you don't want to kick a specific ability. So you decide to gouge instead. It can stop a lot of melee, a lot of other casters just in the tracks for 4 seconds. Really just giving your healers or whatever DPS you have to try to peel for them some breathing room. Some 4 second just guarantee. And it can also be used on powerful abilities that are channeled. Like example you have a Shadow Priest with no artifact weapon. It's a big ability, pretty big cooldown, lots of their damage. And if you're able to gouge that as soon as they start channeling, well then you really literally stop all of the burst damage without having to sacrifice a kick. Or stuff like with a monk. If a monk is going in for a Fist of Fury on a healer and they get the stun and there's a cleave, you can gouge that stun and really take away a lot of that damage. While your healer might get stunned, you are trading a CC for a monk's ability. And it's a very easy CC to use. Like you can throw it around everywhere. It doesn't cost energy with dirty tricks. 10 second cooldown. It generates a common point. So you really have this disrupting mechanic. And then, well, of course, we have Blind, which can be used to uh, force trinkets out of healers to, let's say, have a CC combo and then you blind. And usually most people will trinket blind because that's a two minute cooldown. So they are usually fine trading two minute cooldown for a two minute cooldown. Um, and then we have stuns with between the eyes and cheap shots. We talked about those earlier. We have saps as per usual. You should be utilizing those if ever possible, even vanish saps if you can. And of course you have kicks. So as a rogue, you actually have one extra utility that has a lot of good uses when it comes to gouge. But in Legion, when you just don't have the plethora of abilities that you had in other expansions, gouge ends up kind of falling short, but can be very, very vital if you know how to use it properly. All right, let's talk about the tricks of trade mechanic, which is a mechanic that rogues have had for the longest time, but they removed it in Legion for the most part. Tricks of trade used to be a mechanic where you would tricks a friendly target and once you get in combat, as you would in PvE, in PvP, once you get in combat, then your friendly will have a damage increase. So this way you could either use it for other classes to increase their damage, or you would pop it on a tank, so then the tank can draw more aggro. In PvP, it would work out well because you would just run with a strong melee or a caster and buff their damage flat because you're transferring threat, which in PvP does nothing, but the damage increase still stayed. Outlaw Rogue is the only class right now that still has, or the only spec of Rogue that still has this mechanic of tricks of trade. And hopefully they'll bring it back in the future. And that's kind of your bread and butter when it comes to gameplay in arenas and BGs. And in arenas, while you might not do the most amount of damage, you will allow a Shadow Priest or an Ellie Shaman or a Fury Warrior or an Enhancement Shaman or a Holy Death Knight to do triple the damage than they normally would because of this nifty buff for 50% more damage. Especially during Burst, it is extremely vital and viable. So basically, instead of bringing yourself with more stuns, like a subtle rogue with all the saps and the cheap shots all over the place, instead of bringing the damage from, uh, from your poisons like an assassination rogue, instead you basically have a mechanic on 30 seconds that costs you nothing to buff you and a friendly target for 6 seconds. So the way you would use it is you would trick uh, your friendly, then the next damage and ability you use, whether it be auto attack or whether it be a saber slash or whatever, the next time you deal damage, you will trigger tricks of uh, trade, which will buff you and your friendly target by 15% for six seconds. So you really have to take advantage of the damage that you have and kind of try to line it up. I usually like to have a bunch of common points on the target, maybe like a full six, tricks of trade, stun, Proc my tricks mechanic, I'm bursting with saber slashes while my partner is maybe bursting with the artifact weapon or whatever it might be. So that's how the tricks of trade mechanic works in general. And that's about everything I want to talk about in today's video when it comes to our Rogue PvP guide. Hope you guys enjoyed it, hope it was informative, and I hope you guys enjoy playing your Outlaw Rogue for however long we have the specialization.
I'm predicting that maybe they'll roll back Outlaw in the next expansion. I'm not quite sure if they will or not, but someone tells me in the back of my mind, maybe they'll get rid of it. So enjoy it while it lasts. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see all of you guys in another video.